Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, European spaceflight took something of a step forward, almost exactly a year after the end of the Ariane 5, Ariane 6 finally took its first flight. Lifting off from a new launch facility a couple of miles away from the old Ariane 5 launch pad, Ariane 6, uh, yeah, it headed skywards, propelled by its Vulcan 2.1 engine and its solid rocket motors. Now, this specific one had only two solid rocket motors, but Ariane 6 is designed to be more flexible than its predecessor, so it can have another two solid rocket motors attached. These P120 solid rocket motors are significantly smaller than the two large segmented motors that were used on the Ariane 5. In fact, they are exactly the same motors that are used for the first stage of the Vega C launch vehicle that Europe should be flying, except that there is a problem with the second stage, which has been slowly addressed over the last year. A decade ago, Ariane Space was the place to go if you wanted to launch geostationary satellites because the satellites would launch from a, a launch facility very close to the equator. They would have the least amount of orbital correction needed once they reached geostationary orbit. But, of course, since then, SpaceX has risen to dominance, offering both lower costs and improved capabilities over the Ariane 5. And, of course, many of you are going to immediately point out that since Ariane 6 is not reusable, it can't possibly compare compete with Falcon 9. But when Ariane 6 was proposed, there were many good reasons behind why Ariane Space wanted to do this. It was seen as a simple, safe evolution of Ariane 5 that would keep them relevant. So anyway, back to the launch at hand. This debut launch was carrying a bunch of small test payloads from a number of customers. One thing I do like about this upgrade is that it has Fabulous onboard cameras. These are by far some of the best views we have seen from a rocket. Uh, I believe these cameras for, are from an Irish company. And as somebody that lived in Ireland for five years and understands that Ireland loves its art, this is the kind of thing that I would expect them to produce. The, the footage was absolutely top notch. So Ariane 6 maintains the liquid hydrogen propellant in the core. It uses new P120C rocket, uh, solid rocket motors on the side to get it up to speed initially. Uh, having the hydrogen-fueled core means that it gets you know, fairly good specific impulse, but on the other hand, the engines are not running fancy modern closed cycles, so they give up a bit of performance there. So there's the boosters getting dropped. There is a bit of a delay between this and the onboard camera footage, but you can see the core heading outwards. Again, coming back to these boosters, be sure to pay attention to the orientation of the rocket. Notice that you can see the limb of the Earth as we await the separation of the boosters. Note the little rockets that were used to push the booster away and how the exhaust starts to fade out as the pressure inside these uh, rocket engines or these motors starts to fade away. So now the core is uh, heading off on its own, propelled by the Vulcan 2.1. Uh, this generates about 135 tons of thrust. It's a simple open cycle gas generator, and it shares a lot in common with the Vulcan 2, which was also used on the Ariane 5. I mean, it's really a manufacturing evolution where they're using new uh, like manufacturing techniques, 3D printing, etc., etc., to make it cheaper to produce. It's slightly heavier. It gets better specific impulse, better thrust, but it's not a huge improvement in either of those fields. It takes a fairly big efficiency hit compared to, say, the RS-25 engines because it's using this simple gas generator cycle. Because there's only one engine, the gas generator in the core, which is generating the you know, gas to drive the turbine pumps, uh, that is dumped overboard through a pair of nozzles, and those nozzles can be gimbaled to give the spacecraft steering capability, roll steering capability specifically. There is the fairing getting detached, and I think we get some footage of this. But while we're waiting, look at the tiny payload pallet sitting on top of that uh, payload adapter there. This rocket is clearly designed for a much more substantial payload. There we go. That is what we caught of the payload fairings falling away. And I'm sure we will get better quality footage at some point. But when I watched this live, what I did notice is that that booster camera is no longer pointing at the edge of the Earth. It's actually the entire rocket has pitched upwards 
and is instead of pointing down towards the horizon as is typical over time, the nose gets lower and lower, this has actually made a conscious decision to point upwards and start thrusting upwards. And I was confused initially. This is the kind of thing that if you see it on a launch, you typically think the guidance has got wrong and it's struggling or and it's going to fail. But I also noticed that if you look at the top left, there is a little uh, graph showing the expected altitude versus like time or downrange distance. And it was actually on the middle of that. So this maneuver where it's pointing itself further up was part of the design. This was totally expected, even although this is not the kind of thing you want to do if you want to get the most efficient launch. And so while I haven't seen any official accounts or explanations for this, I think what's going on is that because they have such a light payload and because this light payload isn't going all the way to geostationary orbit, this rocket has way more capability than they need. But they also want to prove to their customers that the rocket is actually capable. They want to collect all the data through a continuous burn. And so by pointing it at this angle, they're basically pointing the booster off axis. And when you don't fire exactly along your velocity vector, you get a, you get a loss of delta V called cosine losses. It basically says if you're firing sideways, you're not actually using that thrust for anything useful. In this case, they intentionally lofted it so that it would uh, go up to a higher altitude on a ballistic trajectory. So they would burn through all the propellant on the first stage of that booster. And then when the second stage got to go, well, it would also have a much longer way to go to orbit and so it could actually burn its engine down to you know, comparable depletion and collect all that data, show that capabilities to their potential customers. I guess the other advantage is that it kept the spacecraft higher up so that they could uh, get really nice video quality you know, downlinked, such as the staging. That's pretty cool to see that stage uh, disappearing like that. I don't think we saw that kind of quality coming from the, uh, the original Ariane 5. So anyway, the high lofted trajectory came up a bit short intentionally, so the second stage would take a long, long time to get up to orbit. And so, of course, we're running this video at higher speed than normal, so you don't have to sit through it. Notice the engine nozzle is glowing here. So this is the new Vinci engine. Like the first stage, this is also burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. The engine in this case is the Vinci, which is an evolution of what's called the HM7B, the engine that was previously used on the Ariane 5 second stage. The difference is they've got rid of the gas generator and, ex and replaced that with a, a, an expander cycle. So instead of intentionally burning hydrogen and oxygen to pump, you know, to drive the pumps of the fuel, they are simply boiling or vaporizing the hydrogen and using that to drive the turbines, which instead you know, drive, pumps the fuel, which makes it more efficient. In fact, this is almost as efficient as America's RL-10, an engine which turns up everywhere, which it is such a workhorse horse for the US community. But it can easily be argued that uh, Vinci is a better engine than the RL-10. It gets comparable specific impulse. It's maybe slightly smaller, but it gets significantly more thrust. We're talking like 18 tons of thrust versus 11 tons of thrust on the RL-10. There was a time when NASA was considering the Vinci engine for the second stage or, or the upper stage of SLS. So anyway, we are far into this second stage burn. We're up about 5.7 kilometers per second. If you look at the, the altitude versus uh, time graph, you'll notice that it actually hit a peak and then it began falling back. But the time it took to do that just added some extra time for it to allow itself to increase its velocity to orbital velocity. At this point, the launch vehicle has been going for over 16 minutes. That's a long time to get to orbit. But I think that's really part of the trajectory design here that normally it could be in orbit by this point. And in fact, it might be beginning its boost towards geostationary orbit. But all these payloads are destined for, you know, low Earth orbit, and therefore they designed it with a longer injection or circularization burn. But even once it achieves the initial orbital injection, 
that's not its final orbit. It's then going to do a circularization burn. And part of this is because they want to demonstrate the new capabilities of Ariane 6. It's going to be able to relight this second stage engine and make orbital adjustments. And while this is nice in low Earth orbit, it is especially nice if you're launching payloads into geostationary orbit. Ariane 5 could throw a lot of hardware into a geostationary transfer orbit where its perigee would be close to the Earth, it would swing all the way out to geostationary orbit, and then the satellites would be responsible for injecting themselves into orbit using their own propulsion. But since Ariane 5 debuted in the 1990s, uh, other competitors have begun offering the ability to inject directly into, into geostationary orbit. So Falcon Heavy has this capability. The upper stage, the second stage of the Falcon 9 remains attached to the satellite, it goes all the way up to geostationary orbit and then relights its engine to perform the injection. So Ariane Space want to add this capability because the customers want this capability. Now to do this, they would need pressurized gas to you know, pressurize the propellant tanks and to spin up the engines. And instead of carrying that along as a series of your know, helium spheres that were held at high pressure, they developed a new piece of kit for the Ariane 6 called the APU, or Auxiliary Propulsion Unit. Note, it is not the auxiliary power unit. It doesn't generate electrical power. This is, it's got a gas generator in there that burns small amounts of hydrogen and oxygen. And one of the things they can do with that heat is they can, um, they can heat up the propellants, the hydrogen and the oxygen, and as that vaporizes, they can use that to repressurize the tanks. And pressurized gas from the tanks is also used for attitude control, so they can uh, maintain the pressure for the attitude control system. And also the exhaust gas from the pump can also be used as a thruster to settle propellant in the tanks. These are ullage thrusters or propellant settling thrusters. They're only about you know, 10 kilograms of thrust. But this little gizmo uh, is core to being able to relight the spacecraft's engines multiple times on orbit and enable them to do these complicated insertion missions. So that's why it's kind of annoying for them that this failed. So they did declare mission success after they performed the second burn on orbit that enabled them to, you know, to get into a circular orbit and deploy a number of the payloads. But then there was supposed to be a third relight of the engine which would push it into a higher orbit uh, where they would deploy some of the other stuff. And yeah, the APU failed after a couple of seconds, and that meant that they couldn't relight the main engine, and so they were stuck because the APU is needed to light the engines. The APU can be used to deorbit the spacecraft, but now the European Space Agency has left its rocket stage in orbit despite intending to deorbit. And moreover, there are a couple of payloads that are not only likely to survive re-entry intact, but were in fact designed to survive re-entry. There were a couple of re-entry capsules, which instead of being deorbited within a few hours and landing on target under a parachute, they're likely to remain in orbit for years. And then when the time comes, they will no doubt streak through the atmosphere and hit into the surface without the aid of a parachute because their electronics will be long dead. So that's one of them there, and yeah, it'll probably remain in space for decades at the altitude it's currently at. I don't know, I, I don't know the exact altitude, but it could be a very long time. And so while the launch vehicle demonstrating that it can get to orbit, demonstrating a relight, the fact that the APU failed on the second relight is definitely a problem because it means that there's a number of missions that they may have signed on to do that they can no longer be certain that they can perform because the customer is expecting multiple relights separated by several hours. It's embarrassing for Ariane Space, who made a commitment to make sure that they're not going to pollute low Earth orbit with a whole bunch of you know, space debris. And unfortunately, due to this failure, there is now a bunch of space debris up there which will last for a long time unless they figure out what to do with it. Now, on the ground, the APU has gone through a lot of testing to verify that it works. The fact that it failed on its third attempt to in space is a sign to me that it's something to do with zero gravity, so it's very likely related to fluid sloshing around in zero gravity, 
uh, something which is very hard to simulate on the Earth, but something that they are going to have to solve if they're going to sell the, the capabilities, the multiple relight capabilities on Ariane 6. The next mission listed on the schedule is CSO3, which is going to sun-synchronous orbit. That probably isn't going to require this capability, so I expect that that will go forwards. There's a handful of communication satellites that say GTO, which in theory doesn't mean uh, means that it doesn't need the APU. But then there's the Galileo spacecraft, which have to go to medium Earth orbit, and that is almost certainly something that they want to have relight capability for. Uh, they've been launching a lot of these using the Soyuz Fregat, which Ariane Space, of course, was buying from uh, Russia and then launching from Kourou. Now that's not an option. The last batch got launched on uh, Falcon 9. So look, it's great to see that Ariane 6 has actually achieved orbit and demonstrated its capabilities as a launch vehicle. It's not quite as capable as they would like. There's a number of missions I think they'll have to put on the back burner until they have solved the APU problems definitively. I don't think it's going to get much in terms of commercial operations, unless that is heavily subsidized by the European Union. And you will see this, there will be national payloads that will be subsidized so that they go on Ariane 6, which is basically, you know, Europe's version of SLS, at least in spirit. It's something where Europe wants its capability, it's prepared to spend to get its capability, and it's not going to go off to private sources to get it. And that's why Ariane 6 will continue to operate despite not being something that works in the modern market. When they were looking at transitioning from Ariane 5 to Ariane 6, it sort of made sense. Ariane 5 was way bigger than it needed to be because they were expecting to fly the European space plane Hermes on it. That meant it had these very big boosters and that meant the rocket was way oversized in the end they would launch two satellites to geostationary orbit because it was so overly capable. Ariane 6 gets rid of the big boosters, replaces them with smaller boosters. Now they can have either two or four, depending upon the payload size. That adds flexibility. The core, sure, they resize a couple of things, but they're using very similar engines that have all been largely tested, been tested and certified. They expected that they would have it flying by 2020. And then that would give them like three years to transition from Ariane 5 to Ariane 6. But they misjudged how long it would take to build out the launch site, to develop the APU. And then, of course, they didn't couldn't anticipate the failures of the Vega C, which would throw their launch schedule amiss. Uh, they had COVID-19, which, of course, messed up all their supply lines. And they said, well, wait a second, you know, if we have any problems, we can always transition payloads over to the Soyuz. Well, of course, since 2022, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that isn't an option anymore. And that's why it's been a year since Ariane 5 before Ariane 6 can start taking up the slack. Even then, this is still very much a test flight. There's clearly some problems that need solved. But having said that, it is successful. It is capable. And I look forward to seeing it fly a whole lot more. And while they're struggling to solve the APU issues, which uh, are required to launch Galileo, I'm sure SpaceX will happily sell them rides on a Falcon 9. And before we go, one last thing. Check out the awesome photos. Yes, these were, these were very neat. Love them. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.